So the way we're going to run this tonight is Bill's going to uh, talk for 30 or 40 minutes, but then we're going to go to Q&A. Uh, we're going to try to end this as close to 8 o'clock as we can, as Bill has other obligations and things to do. Uh, if you have questions along the line, please put them in chat and we'll, uh, uh, um, I'll, I'll sift through those and, and combine where I can uh, questions uh, for Bill to address. <clears throat> the program is also being recorded and it will be posted afterwards on our website and the Michigan Peace Alliance website. So that's peaceedcenter.org and mipeacealliance.org. Uh, so if you have to jump out early, you can still get to it there. I want to give a special thanks to my colleague, Samantha Dillon, uh, for the promotional work and the setting up the Zoom. Oh, but it's not on, is it? No, no. And uh, uh, Tassin Sadar, also a colleague who is here helping with the technology and who's an inspiration to all of us here in the greater Lansing area. Um, while the horrors of war encompass much of the world today, the world's largest arms supplier is chopping at the bit to build sell, use more weapons. To help us look under the covers uh, <clears throat> of the recent release of the President Biden's 2025 budget, we are so fortunate to have this evening Bill Hartung, a veteran of several decades studying the arm industry. Uh, I doubt there's anyone knows more than Bill about this, even though some of his colleagues like Lindsey Kashkarian from the National Priorities Project, Miriam Pemberton from the Institute for Policy Study, maybe Mark Thompson at the Project for Government Oversight, certainly add uh, to our knowledge of what's going on in the in the industry. Um, but we're just so proud to have Bill here tonight. Bill is a senior fellow with the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, he has been focusing on the arm industries for, well, he'll tell you maybe how many years, probably more than he wa wanted to, but... Uh, he was previously the Arms and Security Program Director at the Center for International Policy and the co-director of that center's Sustainable Defense Task Force. He's the author of Profits of War, Lockheed Martin and the Making of the Military-Industrial Complex, the co-editor with Miriam Pemberton of Lessons from Iraq, Avoiding the Next War, and Weapons for All, a critique of the U.S. arms sales policies through the Nixon and, Nixon and Clinton administrations. Uh, Bill also previously directed programs at the New America Foundation and the World Policy Institute. He, he publishes articles frequently both on the Quincy's uh, website at responsiblestatecraft.org, uh, but also with uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Nation, the World Policy Journal. He's been featured on national security issues on CBS 60 Minutes, NBC Nightly News, PBS NewsHour, CNN, Fox News. Fox News? Really, Bill? and scores of other local, regional, and international TV and radio outlets. Uh, let me stop there. Welcome, Bill, and thanks for sharing with us this evening. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Fox News. Yeah, it, it didn't go great, um, but I, I sort of held my own. Um, I, I probably wasn't as uh, measured as I should have been. Um, and you asked if I was if I had the nerve to tell you how long I've been doing this. Um, well, I started in 1979, late Carter. Uh, there was some hope of uh, military spending coming down, but between the invasion of Afghanistan, the fall of the Shah of Iran, and uh, too much power to uh, Carter's hawkish advisor, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, we soon saw things go the other way, you know, early Reagan. Um, so... Uh, yeah, the arms lobby and, and uh, war and peace um, can be a, a grim topic because, you know, we're we're up against it at the moment. But uh, there's a couple things. One is, um, you know, the, there's the money and influence of the corporations and the Pentagon, which certainly drive the budget in, in a substantial way. Um, but there's also ideological issues. Um, I think the fact that President Biden, for his entire adult life has been a staunch supporter of Israel uh, has made it harder for him to kind of deal with the current realities and, and, and change course. Uh, and I think in Ukraine, uh, you know, ultimately it was Putin's decision to go in uh, and the response was more kind of geopolitical thinking than, you know, the companies saying, Oh yeah, let's go in there. But of course, once the war starts, 
uh, they're perfectly willing to take the money and they use these wars as excuses to get all kinds of other favors that have, don't have to do with the war at the moment, but it's an environment where they can uh, kind of get Congress to open the purse even further. Um, and we're now uh, for nuclear weapons work at Department of Energy and the Pentagon, we're well over uh, $900 billion a year heading towards a trillion. Um, and so, you know, I, I think um, the other thing I will say about Ukraine is that some of the things the uh, companies did at the end of the Cold War did set the stage uh, for this kind of thing to happen. For example, uh, when NATO expanded, which a lot of us pushed back against because we said it was going to inflame tensions with uh, Russia, uh, the companies uh, went all in in favor. There was a group called the Committee to Expand NATO, which uh, sublet offices from the conservative uh, American Enterprise Institute, was run by Bruce Jackson, who at that time was also a vice president of uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, and the CEO at the time, Norg Augustine, did a tour of Eastern Europe, kind of implied to countries that if, if they bought Lockheed Martin weapons, Lockheed Martin would lobby for them to get into NATO. Um, they also held workshops in places like Poland uh, with local companies saying, you know, if you get in, we'll give you subcontracts. Uh, so they were, they were definitely viewing this as a money-making opportunity because all the Eastern European countries would be expected to to junk their Russian era weapons and buy new uh, Western weapons. And so the European countries and the U.S. were jockeying to see who could get the biggest slice of the pie. Um, so I do think that, as well as the kind of economic shock treatment of Russia, made it easier for somebody like Putin to come to power because their economy shrunk by 50%. Uh, they kind of felt like they were more or less surrounded. They felt they'd betrayed because NATO was expanded after some promises that that would not happen. Um, so in that environment, somebody like Putin writing in saying, you know, I'm going to bring Russia back was was very appealing to people. So, so I think the original mistake uh, was back then when, when we could have tried to pursue a different kind of relationship. Um, and, I, you know, the um, idea of cashing in on weapons sales to Europe is uh, in high gear uh, since the invasion of Ukraine. Um, last year, the U.S. made about $106 billion in arms deals, uh, which is close to a record. Uh, but $75 billion of that was just to Europe and $40 billion to Poland, which doesn't make a lot of sense because their their uh, military budget is sixteen billion dollars a year. So they're either going to not be able to do this, or they're going to be paying for this stuff in in perpetuity. Um, so the um, you know one thing the companies do is um, kind of insinuate themselves into the policy making process. And, and there's a couple examples uh, under Trump the. Um, National defense strategy that came out kind of shifted away from war on terror, Iraq and Afghanistan to, you know, we need to be able to fight China. Um, and Congress uh, appointed a commission to review the Pentagon's strategy. And, and lo and behold, the Congressional Commission said, well, they're not recommending enough spending. Um, but a closer look at this commission by the uh, Project and Government Oversight found that more than half the members had ties to the arms industry. Uh, there was a retired admiral on the board of North of Grumman. Uh, there were consultants to the industry. There were people from think tanks that are awash in contractor money. Um, so it was not an unbiased group. Uh, but unfortunately, their product, uh, which called for a 3 to 5% increase in Pentagon spending above inflation for as long as the eye could see, uh, became a, a talking point for hawks in Congress. And, uh, James Inhofe from Oklahoma, who for a while was head of Senate Armed Services, used to actually take the report and wave it at witnesses and say, you know, don't you agree with this? Um, so that that kind of, you know, propaganda document that was created by people tied to industry became a, a, a weapon in the, the push for more money. Um, more recently, uh, there was a uh, Congressional Strategic Posture Commission, uh, which came out for a a bigger nuclear buildup was kind of astonishing given that the Pentagon already wants to spend $2 trillion over the next 30 years building new versions of all the whole arsenal of nuclear weapons. Um, 
but it was co-chaired by John Kyle, former senator from Arizona, who was a, a dogged opponent of arms control uh, way back in the 90s. He, he killed any effort to uh, get the U.S. to sign the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Uh, and when he left the Congress, he was a lobbyist for Northrop Grumman, which is the biggest beneficiary of the nuclear buildup. They're making the new intercontinental ballistic missile, the new bomber, um, and he's, you know, closely tied to them. So uh, he and many others of the members were uh, tied to the industry. And uh, I, I watched a hearing on it in Congress, and it sort of showed the other side of the problem, which was that uh, many of the members have arms uh, factories in their states. So I would say out of 10 to 12 questions from the members of the Senate, more than half of them were about uh, weapons built in their state. I mean, you know, the, sort of the equivalent of, well, you know, we make this missile isn't a great thing and shouldn't we build more? So <clears throat> it wasn't like it was a uh, discussion of policy or, uh, you know, how to keep us from getting into a nuclear war. It was all about, uh, you know, bringing home money to their home states until they got to Elizabeth Warren. And she asked Kyle if they had determined how much this all was going to cost. And he said, oh, no, we need this too much. We can't worry about the cost. Um, and she also asked about the prospects of an arms race. So, um, you know, she was kind of a breath of fresh air, but she was in the minority among the the members who asked uh, questions. And so if that's the quality of what Congress is going to ask about such an important topic, we clearly need to uh, put a lot more pressure on them uh, than we are now. Um, and the other thing that the industry has in its favor is the uh, revolving door where they, uh, you know, people go from the Pentagon to work for these companies uh, and then they can kind of, you know, connect to their former colleagues and get all kinds of favors for their new corporate employers. Um, and there's many examples, but one, for example, the head of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Joseph Dunford, had helped give the green light to the F-35, which is the most expensive weapons program in the history of the Pentagon and has all sorts of problems, performance problems. Uh, so shortly after he left government, having kind of helped Lockheed Martin, he, he went on their board of directors. Um, and I did a study last year, you know, what happens to admirals and generals when they leave government? We looked at four stars and 80% of them went to work either directly for the big companies, for, uh, you know, military tech startups, for venture capital funds that fund the military industry. Um, there was one guy who went home and ran the school district in his old uh, state. But that was the only real obvious civilian employment that I noticed. Um, and the biggest news now is uh, Mike Gallagher, who is the hawk who chairs the uh, Congressional China Committee, is going to step down and, and go work for Palantir, uh, which is a, a you know relatively new tech company that uh, you know shouts from the rooftops about how we're falling behind China. Therefore, we need to give Palantir more money. Uh, and it's run by this guy, Peter Thiel, who's uh, kind of died in the wool right-wing ideologue. He's, he's a huge Trump supporter. He doesn't believe government is really necessary. The tech sector will solve all of our problems, of course. Uh, so that's a little unusual for a weapons industry executive. The, the big companies like Lockheed Martin don't really want to offend either party because their strategy is, you know, the Democrats will be in power at one point, the Republicans at the other. They want to keep ties to both. So whoever's in power, they can, they can, you know, work them politically. Uh, but some of the new kind of, you know, tech folks um, are very um, ardent kind of libertarians in, in the negative sense of, you know, not believing in government, being very illogical. Um, and, and he falls into that category. So, so that's where uh, this hawkish member of Congress is is going to land. Uh, he's basically going to profit from the kind of rhetoric he was pushing, you know, while he was in Congress. Um, and, you know, part of the new push uh, for, you know, weapons driven by artificial intelligence, and pilot's vehicles, kind of the wave of the future um, 
is very closely tied to corporate influence. So um, Kathleen Hicks, who's the deputy defense secretary, gave a speech uh, last summer to the National Defense Industrial Association, which is the biggest um, trade association of weapons makers. Um, and the gist of it was, um, while she introduced this new initiative called the Replicator Initiative, which was about building huge numbers of new uh, weapons, like things like, you know, we want swarms of drones that can hit a thousand targets in 24 hours. And there was a lot of rhetoric about uh, outpacing China, uh, being able to beat China in a war, uh, you know, making sure that the uh, Chinese leadership, when they woke up in the morning, were worried about us. So it's kind of unusual for the Pentagon to be quite so in your face in, in their anti-China rhetoric. Um, and their argument was that this new technology was going to leapfrog us ahead of the Chinese to the point where we could kind of intimidate them into doing what we wanted. Um, and there was a couple of problems with that. First of all, you know, she said, oh, we'll have some of these things in 18 months, which would be record time for the Pentagon and the industry. Um, the F-35, which was supposed to be, well, at the time, this kind of new, very efficient, uh, you know, simple, cheap aircraft that could be produced quickly, uh, took 23 years from initial development to the first plane actually being ready to fly. And now they're saying, oh, this new stuff will be ready in 18 months. Um, and already, um, you know, the tech industry was hoping to make money off of the performance of their weapons in Ukraine. You know, so oh, look at these new miracle weapons in Ukraine hold off the Russians. Um, but there was a recent Wall Street Journal piece ends up the Ukrainians aren't using the U.S. small drones because they say they don't work very well. They're kind of brittle. They're too expensive. Uh, so they're actually buying drones from China uh, to fight the Russians, which is a little bit ironic because our position of our government is that China and Russia are shoulder to shoulder uh, as enemies of, you know, a peaceful world. But in this case, China's actually helping Ukraine. I mean, they're doing it probably for the money, but nonetheless, they are doing it. And, and these drones perform so poorly that even the company that builds them said, oh, yeah, we got to do better, you know. Uh, so this is, was a bit of a um, dent in, in the marketing strategy of the tech firms because they wanted to point to how wonderful their weapons were. And this was a kind of painful counterexample, you know, from their point of view. Um, so, um, yeah, and I would say that, you know, the, the last thing about the, this kind of mania for new technology is how dangerous it is. It is. Uh, there's a couple of things. Michael Clare, who's been doing this even longer than I have, um, and was a mentor of mine when I first got started, uh, did a piece for the Arms Control Association about th this emerging technology, uh, which has the possibility of taking humans out of the loop and just having the machines uh, make the decisions. Uh, he looked mostly at the nuclear issue. If you control nuclear weapons with these kinds of systems, the danger of an accidental war could go up dramatically. Um, and also, if they failed in a conventional war, you could have large numbers of people killed by these machines. And if you think about it, you know, it's going to be the most complicated software ever built. And gee, you know, has software ever failed? Yes. So, um, you know, the, the venture capital companies and the Silicon Valley folks who want to cash in on this are trying to push the government to deploy it as quickly as possible when really what we need to do is step back, say, do we even want this stuff? Um, and that'll be a fight. Luckily, there's some people in Silicon Valley, uh, engineers and others, uh, pushing back against this uh, and more recently against the use of some of this uh, weaponry in uh, Israel's attacks on Gaza. Um, so, um, I would say the other thing to think about is, is how the industry affects, um, particular policies and regions. So there's a big buildup in the Pacific, uh, by the U S as part of this focus on China. Um, and probably the biggest example is in Guam where a third of the land is already controlled by the U S military. Uh, but they're going to deepen the ports to be able to handle nuclear submarines. They're going to build a dozen new missile defense systems. They're bringing, uh, building a new marine base because they're going to reduce their presence 
in Okinawa, where there's been large protests against the U.S. base. Um, so the, it's they're even more so than before. They're they're turning Guam into kind of like a just a platform uh, for the U.S. military, and there's been a you know renewed opposition to that in Guam. Uh, although there's also a sector of folks in Guam who either because they're on the payroll of the U.S. military, or they're still in the older generation are thankful that the U.S. pushed the Japanese out, who were, you know, very brutal uh, to the local population. So there's a bit of a split, but the, the it's leaning towards uh, trying to push back against such a large U.S. presence and, and also finally get uh, independent control of their politics. That they're they don't have that now. Uh, they don't have they have a delegate to Congress, but they're not voting. Um, so anyway, it, it ends up uh, a colleague of mine, um, Jonathan Geyer, who used to write for Vox and, that, and now is a freelance, did an excellent piece about U.S. policy in the Pacific broadly, especially Pacific Islands. And they had a special envoy, uh, Joseph Yoon, who renegotiated U.S. access to uh, Guam, the Marshall Islands, other places where the U.S. had facilities. Um, and it ends up at the same time he was doing that, he was still getting paid by the uh, Asia Group, which is essentially a lobbying firm, although they try to get around the restrictions that lobbying firms have by saying, oh, we just give strategic advice. So, so they're, they're trying to kind of use Orwellian language to have less regulation on what they do. Uh, but they were founded in part by uh, Kurt Campbell, who's a hawkish Democratic Asia expert and now is a second in charge of the State Department. Um, and a lot of their clients are uh, military companies, including Lockheed Martin, which, you know, as these agreements get um, extended, it stands to make billions uh, building these missile defense sites and upgrading the, they, they test um, nuclear ballistic missiles, shooting them out to the Pacific. And so the, the, component that's in the Pacific will be expanded and Lockheed Martin will get money to do that. So it's kind of a blatant conflict of interest, but uh, you know, the, the government has said, well, he was only a consultant. We can't tell him what to do in his spare time. So they kind of just let this happen. Um, and in, in addition to the lobby for uh, artificial intelligence and, and the new weapons, uh, as I mentioned, there's this huge uh, nuclear weapons buildup. And one of the most controversial parts of it is is a new ICBM. Um, uh, William Perry, who was Secretary of Defense way back in the Clinton era, has said uh, ICBMs are probably the most dangerous weapons we have because in a crisis, uh, if there's a warning of attack, the president has a matter of minutes to decide, is it a real attack? Should I launch the weapons? Uh, so the danger of a accidental war is is high, certainly higher than with any other configuration of nuclear weapons. So um, over the years, there's been members who've tried to defund it or at least study alternatives to it. Um, and there's a, a group in the Senate called the ICBM Coalition that has blocked any effort to reduce the numbers, study alternatives. They even... Uh, they they went from 450 to 400 uh, ICBMs under, under the new START treaty, and they wanted to destroy the empty silos. And the coalition said, "Oh no, we need those in case we build up again." So they pretty much blocked any positive arms control steps related to ICBMs. And it's the senators from the states they either have ICBM bases or where they build significant parts of the new ones. So it's uh, small states: Wyoming, North Dakota, Montana. Uh, and Utah, but they have incredible clout in part because the Senate is always in the balance. So nobody wants to, um, you know, lose a Senator uh, by, you know, cutting spending to their state. And so um, it's mostly Republicans now, but John Tester Montana is chair of uh, defense appropriations a subcommittee in the Senate. So he's got a, a lot of power to make sure the money keeps flowing. Uh, for these missiles. And uh, Northrop Grumman, in addition to lobbying Congress, giving donations, making exaggerated claims about the jobs involved here, 
um, also works with local chambers of Congress and coalitions to get them to be more effective in their lobbying of Congress. Um, and um, uh, there's a, a very sharp uh, journalist, um, Taylor Barnes, who works for a place called Inkstick Media. And she's been kind of doggedly forcing the companies to justify these kind of big claims they're making about, uh, you know, how many jobs they create, for example. So they actually, uh, you know, they asked the state of Utah where Northrop Grumman was claiming a huge job impact to uh, show the documentation that, that this was in fact true. Uh, and they refused to release it on the basis that it was confidential business information for Northrop Grumman. So they have pro bono lawyers now suing uh, the state of Utah to release this information. And it seems pretty clear they don't want to because they can't prove that there's as many jobs as they claim. And, uh, you know, when I've looked at other programs, usually the actual number of jobs is half or less what the companies claim. Um, and they're often concentrated in a small number of places. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Taylor also found that, um, you know, the Industry Trade Association does these annual reports on, you know, the strength of the arms industry. And according to the companies themselves, uh, jobs in the weapons industry are about a third of what they were 30 years ago. They went from 3 million to 1 million because of outsourcing overseas, because of automation, because they build fewer copies of things that are more sophisticated electronically. Uh, so their claims about how we need these jobs are, are much less persuasive than they were even a short time ago. And our our workforce in the country is 160 million or so. So those million jobs are important to the places they're based and the people who have them, but they're not a big factor in the national economy. Um, and the United Auto Workers, who are heavily represented in the arms industry, have started a committee to look at alternatives to building weapons uh, so their members can find other ways to make a living. And a union hasn't really done that sort of thing since about the 80s, when the machinist union under their president, William Wimpersinger, uh, supported conversion from military production to civilian production. And then before that, the big person was Walter Ruther of the auto workers union back at the end of the Vietnam War. So this happens in cycles. But the interesting thing here is uh, this committee is very committed to um, reducing Pentagon spending, moving people into civilian work. Whereas in the past, sometimes the union position was more like, well, of course, we're going to take the money to build the weapons, but we need a fallback in case it, there's a, a downward slope. So they kind of wanted to do both. They wanted more civilian options and keep building weapons. Whereas the current leadership that's looking at this actually wants to reduce the size of the military economy, which would be a very good thing. Um, and um, I'm trying to see what else I'd like to say. Uh, oh, no, here's... Um, occasionally, the Pentagon will actually try to cancel a weapon system because they want to build new things and, and they can't afford to do both, keep the old stuff, build the new stuff. So there's a... a a ship called the literal combat ship, literal, like, you know, offshore, not literal, like literally. And um, uh, it came to be known as the little crappy ship LCS because it was so dysfunctional and it was built to do many things, mine clearance, get up close to shore to, you know, land troops. Um, but it ends up, it was poorly armored and probably couldn't defend itself against, you know, a uh, missile being shot at it. And, once they shifted to this China strategy, it didn't really fit the Navy's plan. So they were going to get rid of some of them. And the companies that made money from maintaining them, which were mostly in Jacksonville, Florida, and up in Virginia, uh, got their members of Congress to push back. And so the Navy couldn't actually get rid of these things. And so they had to maintain them, spend money on them. At the same time, they wanted to build new things. So of course, the, the way the Pentagon solves that is to do both. So the, the budget went up even higher than it would have. Um, and this happened with many other things. There was various combat planes they wanted to retire, and Congress blocked that. Um, so even when the Pentagon wants to kind of 
be mildly strategic or make choices, uh, they have to push back against the arms lobby, which would rather do both and than either or. Um, and this is what's going to happen with this emerging technology that, you know, one theory is, all right, if you're building all these drones and these artificial intelligence driven weapons and they're more accurate and it can move more quickly, then you don't need aircraft carriers and huge fighter planes and so forth. But that older stuff is built by the big five companies, Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, Raytheon, and they don't want to let go of that. So there's going to be probably a little bit of an internal fight between the emerging military tech firms and the old guard. Uh, and in fact, some of the uh, new companies, uh, there's this company, uh, Anduril, which makes underwater drones, various other things. And it's run by a, a 31 year old named Palmer Lucky, who made his fortune with um, the Oculus system. These little glasses you put on to, to see 3D, decided to get into the weapons industry. And, um, you know, he's a character he wears, you know, like Hawaiian shirts and sandals to work. And he's, but he also, his company has written this manifesto about how the big five are, they've served their purpose. You know, they helped us in the Cold War and now they're kind of dinosaurs and it's time for them to retire and, and let the tech firms take over. So there will be some contention between the current generation of contractors and, and this new wave. Um, and there's a couple of possibilities. One is that the big companies just buy up the startups. And the other is that they actually start losing market share to these other uh, companies. So, so there'll be some internal fights, which may result in opportunities, you know, while the industry's fighting with itself to maybe uh, rein them in a bit. Um, so I haven't counted the minutes and it could be all and earlier and I have more questions, which is always my preference. Um, but on the jobs question, um, Miriam Pemberton, who, who was mentioned at the beginning, uh, had done had, did a book in the last few years where she did case studies of communities that tried to reduce their dependence on Pentagon spending. And there were some promising initiatives that were kind of nipped in the bud uh, because the government kind of didn't follow through with enough uh, financial support. Uh, but in, in uh, California, during one of the downturns, they started uh, a consortium of companies, uh, civilian and military, and state and local government with some federal money to try to create um, electric cars. And this was well before the current era. And um, it actually made some progress, and they were integral to um, creating the, the batteries that are used in current cars. Um, but then the Pentagon budget started going up again, and a lot of the companies gravitated back to that. Um, so it was a promising initiative that wasn't fully followed through on. And then in um, New York, uh, there were some engineers at uh, Lockheed Martin who wanted to apply uh, military technology to making powertrains for um, energy efficient uh, buses. And they were successful and they sold these to cities all over the world. Um, and th that's still going on, but it, it was not compared to the billions and billions from the Pentagon. It was sort of a, almost a side business, but it did demonstrate that it can be done. Um, so Miriam's main point is, you know, you can come up with new technology, you can retrain workers, uh, but unless there, there's the investment behind it, you, you can't compete with, $900 billion for the Pentagon. Uh, you know, so for example, Southeastern Connecticut, they make, uh, you know, ballistic missile submarines that, that can fire nuclear weapons in uh, Groton, Connecticut, sort of near the border with uh, Rhode Island. And, you know, they get a billion a year or more just for that area to do that activity. So if they were to cut back, um, and there's been some ups and downs and, and, when it's gone down, uh, the workers who get laid off end up doing things like being greeters at a casino compared to a fairly well-paying uh, union job as a, say, a welder sort of thing. Um, that's changing too because they've uh, they've changed the contract so the incoming workers don't get as good a deal as the existing workers. And there was actually a, an independent journalist who looked at Electric Boat, found out that some of the new hires 
were applying for subsidized housing. So the idea that these were the these good paying union jobs has been eroded. Um, and again, Taylor Barnes, uh, my colleague, uh, looked at unionization at the big companies. And that used to be one of their arguments. You know, these are good union jobs. They're hard to come by. Um, but the uh, unionization has gone down dramatically. You know, Lockheed Martin used to have 70% of their workers unionized. Now it's about 20%. Northrop Grumman is 4%. So there's fewer jobs. They don't pay as well. They have fewer union protections. Uh, they, they moved, Lockheed moved its uh, F-16 fighter plane work uh, to South Carolina, which is a right to work state. Um, so the jobs argument is is of diminishing value and reality and how it affects our economy. But it's a little bit about where the jobs are, because a lot of the members who do have the remaining facilities in their states and districts make sure they get on the Armed Services Committee or the Defense Appropriations Committee. And they have the most sway over how much we spend on the Pentagon and what we spend it for. So they're the ones who you know, keep them from retiring weapon systems, add more F-35s than the Pentagon asked for. Uh, so they're they're the bottleneck and they have disproportionate power because of the committees that they've uh, chosen. Um, so that's kind of the outline of, of some of the ways that the industry influences what we spend in the Pentagon, our foreign policy. Um, you know, President Biden, sadly, because of the army of Ukraine, uh, called our arms industry the arsenal of democracy, uh, which doesn't really fit with what the U.S. industry does in the rest of the world, uh, like arming Saudi Arabia for its brutal war in Yemen or a country like Egypt, which is um, undemocratic, which is repressing its own citizens, uh, or Nigeria, where there's been you know, thousands of people have died in military prisons, or the Philippines, where the prior regime basically was gunning people down in the streets. Um, these have all places that were getting U.S. weapons. So uh, needless to say, this notion of the arsenal of democracy was a bit misleading uh, because we, you know, we sell, um, I looked at this Freedom House uh, does an analysis of countries' level of democracy. And, uh, you know, our weapons go to, uh, more than 30 countries that they have determined to be undemocratic. Uh, and if you look at all the conflicts in the world going down to a fairly low level, two thirds of them have uh, countries that have been armed by the United States, either one or both sides. So the idea that our weapons are primarily for defense, that they're stabilizing, uh, doesn't hold up if you look at the big picture. Um, and, you know, Terry mentioned uh, the United States is the biggest arms selling nation usually about 40% of the global market compared to maybe 10% for France or Russia. Um, and, you know, they want a bigger sh share, uh, including by uh, finding more ways to subsidize arms exports, limiting the amount of vetting they get on the way out in terms of looking at human rights implications and things like that. So, you know, how do we fight back? Um, you know, I, I think the the movement to stop the killing in Gaza and our subsidizing with our tax dollars and getting some of our institutions that are indirectly supportive of it to pull out, as with the uh, investment campaigns at the universities, I, I view it as a positive sign because there was there's been a surge of activism. Some of the groups that are leading this were relatively small at the beginning of, of this process, and now the moon has spread to universities all over the country. Um, and my hope is that, uh, you know, there's the crisis at the moment, which is stopping the killing in Gaza, but I'm hoping some of these young activists stick with it, uh, do various kinds of progressive and peace activities uh, when this crisis is over. And that was my experience as a student in the 70s. I was involved in the uh, divestment campaign over, over South Africa Many of the activists that I worked with stayed in progressive circles. They became union organizers. They worked in immigration reform. Uh, they did peace research. Uh, so it, it sort of built this group of activists who committed 
uh, to work on these issues really for the rest of their lives. Um, so in addition to the current, you know, activism that this, these folks are showing, I'm hoping that they will be, a, you know, a, a new kind of um, catalyst for, for a larger uh, peace movement. Um, and we clearly uh, are up against it in the sense that it, certainly in Washington, it's a new Cold War atmosphere. Um, and people who make sensible statements about not having an arms race with China, or if we're going to arm Ukraine, we should have a diplomatic strategy to make sure the war doesn't go on endlessly, uh, or even that we should stop subsidizing the killing in Gaza, are accused of being pro-Russia, pro-China, pro-Hamas. So there's there's kind of an ongoing uh, smear campaign against people who are for kind of sensible policies that are more likely to resolve conflicts. So so that's a, a big challenge. Um, but I think, you know, the students working on the Gaza issue have been exemplary in that effect because they haven't backed down in the face of threats about being suspended, sending the police in after them. Things have actually gotten bigger, you know, like when they cleared the Columbia campus with riot police, uh, universities all over the country started encampments in solidarity with um, what had happened at Columbia. And, you know, and even the police, when they came in, said, like, why are we here? This is a peaceful gathering. They're being cooperative. Um, they were kind of scratching their heads. So when the police are like the peaceniks and the head of the university is the the, the one who's the harshest, uh, something's seriously wrong. And, and in some cases, I mean, they're just running scared because of the intimidation they're getting from the uh, right-wing members of Congress. Uh, but there's some outrageous, ironic developments that would almost be funny if they weren't so serious. Like when the Speaker of the House, Mike Gallagher, went to Columbia to talk to students who were against the ceasefire movement and, and claimed it was in the name of fighting anti-Semitism. I didn't see a single major paper that pointed out that his background is strongly tinged with relationships with white supremacists. Uh, he's also an advocate of the replacement theory, which says that the reason that em immigrants are being let in is to um, uh, counteract and, and reduce the power of white America. And that theory is, is very strong in right-wing circles, including the person who, who killed 11 people at the synagogue in Pittsburgh a little while ago. So here's somebody who supports and consorts with and is part of that system, uh, claiming he's against anti-Semitism. And I didn't see a single major paper mention it, ask him a question. Uh, so there's a lot of education that needs to happen um, for people to understand the dynamics of the situation that we're in. Um, but I do take some hope in the in the uh, growth of activism about Gaza. Um, I think there's some creative ideas about how to revive uh, the nuclear movement, including a lot of kind of cultural and artistic work. Um, I was at a panel, um, you know, observing a panel over the weekend at um, the New York Arts Book Festival, which is huge. I had never been there, but uh, they did a panel of an artist who, um, it's hard to explain unless you were there, but um, basically made a connection between kind of horticulture and the nuclear buildup because her her specialty is, is collecting roses with violent names. It was a, like her hobby, but she found one named after the atom bomb. And so uh, she's been getting them planted around Europe uh, as a way to generate conversation about why do we have these things in the first place. And it's actually, it's kind of brought in an interesting group of people who don't really want to think about nuclear weapons. They're interested in growing plants, but once they get there, they do this whole educational campaign um, to, to get them thinking about, the, you know, the nuclear issue. And um, a lot of people came, it was a huge gathering. Um, it was just an interesting way at it. And, um, the uh, lead person is an Australian woman named uh, Gabriella Hurst. And based on the kind of work she did at a gigantic conference, uh, mostly focused on Australia, 
and its history in the bomb program because the UK did a lot of their testing there because, of course, they claimed there was empty land. And whenever they say that, it means there's people there that they don't care about who end up uh, absorbing the radiation and so forth. Um, and and the, the Oppenheimer movie uh, has spawned a lot of activism and education about what the movie left out. You know, it's, it's really the story of one man's agony over his role in building the bomb. It's not so much about showing what happened to Japan or people affected by radiation or all the other consequences. Um, and they gave a little bit of time to the fact that there were physicists who didn't want to use the thing. But basically in the movie, Oppenheimer dismisses them and that's the last you hear of it. Um, and people like Joseph Rotblatt who won the Nobel Prize who said, I'm not doing this, this makes no sense. And, built a global scientist movement against the bomb uh, in the movie, you know, he doesn't exist, but anyway, so the fact that that's made uh, people think about it, there's a movie about Einstein's opposition to the bomb. There's a documentary uh, about the history of nuclear weapons and the opposition to it. There's a little bit of activity uh, that's putting it on the public agenda in, in a different way. Um, and also, you know, eventually people are going to say, you know, well, how much are we spending on this? The question that this commission wouldn't ask answer when Senator Warren asked them, but um, you know we have bridges falling over, uh, climate change is a reality, um, poverty is growing. Um, somehow we have to bring together the people that are on the short end of our economic and environmental policies to to join the fight against military buildups and nuclear weapons. Uh, but it's not easy because people. They have their own struggles in their daily lives. They're up against this kind of notion that we can't quite shake, which is that, you know, America is always the good guy, always has positive intentions. Even when things go wrong, it's a mistake. It's not, you know, you can't really hold our leaders accountable. Um, that still has some sway with people. Um, and we need to break through that, as well as the idea that weapons are like an insurance policy. Well, more is better. Um and it, it's quite the opposite. So anyway, I'm, I'm glad you all, uh, you know, joined us. And I'm um, I'm always hopeful about that we can turn these things around. I mean, I have to admit part of it is because I'm just stubborn and I don't want them to get away with it without having to answer for what they're doing. But 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 I do believe with this uh, surge of activism among a younger generation, it, it's going to bring a, a new balance to the politics of this issue. And a lot of the people that I work with and talk to, uh, you know, in my circles, doing analysis and advocacy on the Hill are in their mid to late twenties. And they're much more, um, they have a much bigger vision, a much more ambitious vision of what they want to see in the world. Um, and I think that's very positive. Um, and they're also super smart and committed. Um, so that also gives me uh, some hope keeps me on my toes. Um, so that's plenty. Um, we should, um, we should talk some, and I, I don't know, should I just read the chat or should people, um, say their questions? What's best, Terry? I'll mute myself. There we go. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, how about I'll, I'll, I'll read through mm -hmm. real quick, Bill, and yeah. uh, you can jump. Thank you very much. We'll give you the applause at the end here so we can. Now, is it really seven fifty three? Yeah, it is somewhere. All right. Yeah. Well, um, so we can go a little over, you know, so we have a few questions. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's not too many. So, um, from Rich Peacock from uh, Peace Action Michigan, what, what are programs uh, are vulnerable to being downsized by public pressure or what should our priorities to reduce Pentagon spending be, or is there any nuclear weapons programs that are vulnerable from public pressure? What would you think? Well, I think the biggest thing to go after is probably the new ICBM because it's, as uh, former Secretary Perry said, it's probably the most risky, dangerous weapon in the arsenal. Uh, and there are a lot of experts who say we can do without it. We have to go against that ICBM lobby that I mentioned. But the other thing that's happened is it's cost growth. It's grown in cost by 37% in, since they started a couple of years ago which under law should mean the possibility of suspending the program. Uh, but there's a presidential waiver, which was granted. But so between the cost, the danger, 
I think that would be a good thing to prioritize you know, going after that. Um, the F-35, because it's such an expensive program and because it's, it doesn't work, uh, usually half of them or more are in the hangar at any one time being fixed. Um, they can't deploy them. Uh, a lot of things that's supposed to be able to do, it doesn't. Um, so, so I think that's vulnerable. I mean, I'm not, I'm not always thrilled with the argument of, you know, we need better, shinier weapons because I don't think we should be using them. But um, I think a lot of people, uh, even beyond the peace movement, would say, well, we're paying a huge amount of money for this thing that doesn't work. It, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, but, but the big savings really would be reducing the size of the armed forces. Because <laughs> as long as you have the troops, you have to pay them, you have to feed them, you have to have health care, and you have to give them weapons to use. So if you don't reduce the size of the force, it's hard to, to get real savings. And so that would mean instead of a, a strategy that says we have to be able to win a war against Russia or China and intervene against Iran or North Korea and keep the global war on terrorism going. And if, I mean, you know, on the right, they want to like militarize, further militarize the Mexican border and even possibly bomb the drug cartels. So you know, this whole notion that uh, we need to be a global military power to uh, keep us safe is so out of whack with reality that it, it's amazing. I mean, if you look at what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, where we spent $8 trillion, hundreds of thousands of people died, huge numbers of our vets came in with PTSD and traumatic brain injuries. Um, if, if you just look objectively at what this kind of global use of force has done, you would say, well, uh, it's a disaster. Uh, but this notion that it's it's the way to protect us is still being peddled, um, often by people who supported disastrous wars like Iraq in the first place, who really should not be consulted as experts, but often are. And the people who got it right and said this war should not happen still don't get the kind of uh, platform that they deserve, except in um, independent media like Democracy Now! or, or that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I think the first priority is reduce the size of the force, get rid of things like the, the nuclear bomber, uh, get rid of aircraft carriers, which are very expensive, are really about intervention, projecting force against other countries. Also, uh, can be sunk by a modern missile that costs a fraction of what it costs. Because if you know an aircraft carrier costs $13 billion, needs all these ships to protect it. It's almost like its own little navy. Uh, and even folks, you know, um, some of the hawks are like, yeah, you know, enough already with the aircraft carriers. So I think that's another possibility. And then the Pentagon um, employs huge numbers of private contractors, over half a million. And many of them do jobs that overlap with what government employees do. They cost more. Um, we could scale that back dramatically and, and save huge amounts of money. So that's where I would start. And, and of course, the biggest thing to me is make it harder to go to war. Uh, and part of that is making sure Congress actually gets a vote before we do it. But in the climate we're in, that might not be enough. Uh, so I think we also need just more public pressure. And, and, and that means sort of fresh people working with us. And I think we have the prospect of being able to do that. Um, and part of it is to make the peace movement welcoming, uh, which means uh, as challenging as it can be, it's got to have, there's got to be some sense of camaraderie, of fun, of that th this is the right thing to do and it doesn't have to be depressing. And, and you saw that in prior movements, some of the student movements, civil rights movement, where the spirits were quite high despite the daunting um, obstacles. Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of how I see that. Um, I think those are some priorities that we we should have. Okay, there's some some good points in here that aren't our questions. I'm going to skip over those. Other people should look at those and get the uh, from Cheryl at the uh, uh, Women's International League for Peace and uh, and uh, Freedom. Uh, question from Jack Smith: Do you think there's any real basis for the distinction between offensive and defensive weapons? I'm thinking about the latest round of military funding for Israel. Uh, yeah, it's mixed. I mean, I, I do think, sure, uh, so some of the things they have 
can protect against incoming missiles. But uh, there's also the notion of the sword and the shield. You know, you use the shield to make it easier to use the sword. And that's certainly the case with strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, uh, under Reagan, uh, they came this close to agreeing to uh, abolition of nuclear weapons, but Reagan wouldn't give up Star Wars. Uh, and Gorbachev said, well, but if you have a defense and then you kind of break out and you build nuclear weapons and you can attack us and you won't be hurt in return, that those so-called defensive weapons actually make it easier for you to launch a first strike. So, you know, at that level, the interaction between defensive and offensive um, is not necessarily stabilizing. And, you know, Reagan actually, one of the reasons he did Star Wars is because his advisors were afraid of the freeze campaign. You know, they told him, well, you know, it's not just a few peaceniks now, it's the mainstream churches. It's really, it's kind of, you know, got a strong base in society. And you may uh, pay a political price if you don't show that you care about this. So the one prong that was, well, I'll, sh I'll tell people that we have a technical fix. We'll have this, you know, Astrodome defense. Then we can keep building our nuclear weapons. We won't be vulnerable to theirs. But then another track, which uh, George Schultz pushed, was to actually have an arms control proposal. And I don't know how serious they were at first, but when Gorbachev met them more than halfway, uh, they actually were willing to make reductions. And the, there's some discussion that Reagan, you know, had this visceral opposition to actually using these things. One other theory is that Nancy was whispering in his ear that, you know, you don't want your legacy to be that you were a warmonger. And, you know, it's, it's hard to verify those things, uh, you know, know exactly what was in people's mind. But to me, the biggest point was there was a disarmament movement, uh, the freeze campaign, the million people in Central Park, network television, movie about the consequences of nuclear war. Um, I think that's what turned Reagan around. Uh, but, you know, powers that be don't like to admit that people power works. So th they're never going to give us credit for that. But I, I see it that way. Okay, a couple last questions. I'm, I'm going to throw uh, one in. Can I ask a question verbally? Uh, hold hold on, please. Um, the um, what is the role of the uh, the, the forced unfunded mandates that uh, now go into the the presidential budget that gets listed with the Pentagon? Is is working to repeal those uh, something that would help reduce the the push? Or yes, yes, and it's been a priority this year of the Friends Committee, which is great. Um, it's it's a tool to jack up the budget because it's actually you know all the services. The Pentagon already puts out a huge budget. And then the services give these lists to Congress and say, by the way, it'd be great if you'd also give us X, Y, and Z. And then the Hawks in Congress take those lists and say, oh, look, the military wants this. And in some years, they add 10, 20, 30 billion dollars on that basis. Um, so stopping those would, would be a positive step. And uh, when Robert Gates was defense secretary, he actually kind of told the services, you got to stop doing this. And Congress then passed a law that's saying they must do it. So they want to get rid of that law uh, that says they must do it. And, and then they want to push that these things not be uh, provided and, and at least say, well, if the Pentagon puts out a budget, that's it. We're not going to let people manipulate it to buy additional things, most of which are not, don't really have a strategic purpose. It's just about, you know, pumping more money into the system. So, so I, I think that that would be a useful thing to to do. And, and there's actually some support in the government. I mean, even the Secretary of Defense said, yeah, this doesn't really make that much sense. So it's mostly coming from Congress and the contractors uh, and some of the services. But but at the top levels, there's actually some openness to uh, to changing that policy. OK, a couple more. And then the, the, that person that had the, wanted to ask it verbally could type it in the uh, into the chat. It would be easier. But if we have time at the end, we'll throw that in. Um, yeah. Great talk. Thanks. I'm an anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist, and I agree with everything you said. It looks pretty bleak for our country. Corporate power is how Mussolini described fascism. Do you really think there is still hope for the U.S. system of capitalism? This comes from Bill Meyer from Michigan Peace Council. Uh, well, I guess I would flip it and say, can we reduce, curb, replace it? Because there's no question that um, it's a huge part of the problem. You know, um, Dr. King, at the end of his life, uh, talked about, you know, um, 
racism, extreme materialism as being roots of the problem. Um, and I think it's certainly true. Um, and I think if you look at things like, why can't we have a uh, rational policy for dealing with climate change? Or why can't we, as a rich country, feed people? Or why can't we move away from um, arms production, which is probably the only form of socialism we have, which is that the weapons companies are social, you know, they're subsidized, they're supported, uh, they get free research money. Whereas any other sector of things that we need, that rarely happens. Uh, so yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, my daughter's always getting on my case because she wants to use the word imperialism more often. Um, and you know, I, my argument is usually that, you know, I'm willing to describe the process, but there's a bias against, you know, people sort of say, well, you know, you're out there, but, but there's something to be said for just straight up saying we need a different system. It's just, uh, it's, we're not very far along in, in people being open to that. Um, but, but I think ultimately that that's going to have to be part of the solution. Cause as long as it's profits come first, making money comes first, everything else has to fall behind that. Uh, we're not going to solve the, the level of problems that, that we have, you know. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to combine these two questions. They both re relate in a way to Israel, Palestine, and you could, piece them apart as you choose. How how best to uh how best to connect opposition to to US support for Israel to the need to reduce military spending? And the other question is, is the war in Palestine profit driven? Uh yeah, well, I think it's such a crisis at the moment that a lot of the focus is going to be on stopping the killing, stopping the aid to Israel, pressuring Netanyahu. But I think in the context of that, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the activists are looking at the military system. You know, so there's a lot of uh, uh, push to divest uh, university portfolios from the weapons companies that are profiting from the murder in Gaza. Um, and I think once that is the case, uh, it, it's like an opening to look at the bigger picture. You know, I mean, in my career, I started uh, writing about um, companies that were breaking the arms embargo against South Africa. And then I from there started looking at the whole system and Pentagon spending. So I, I think that that could evolve, but I think at the moment it's crisis mode over Gaza. Um, I don't think it's profit driven in the sense that it happened because the companies want to make money. I, I think, you know, the Netanyahu government has expansionist desires and he's actually got cabinet members to the right of him, if that's possible. Uh, and then President Biden, unfortunately, seems to have this, Israel right or wrong view of the world. Uh, but the companies, once it starts, they look for every possible way to profit from it. And, and they're certainly doing that now. Um, and there's companies like Palantir, uh, which is a, a tech company, um, that are very much intertwined with the Israeli military with helping them with intelligence, communications, targeting. Um, and there, there's a independent um magazine in um, Israel called uh, 972. And they looked at their use of artificial intelligence, which the um, propaganda view is, oh, you know, it's great because targeting can be more precise and there's fewer civilian casualties. And ends up Israel is using artificial intelligence to figure out how to increase the pace of the bombing, find more targets, bomb more quickly. And one of the reasons so many people have died in such a short time is because they've accelerated the pace of their bombing and it's partly because of this artificial intelligence system so it's it's actually it makes killing more efficient and more widespread so so all the all this notion that it's somehow going to lead to more humane warfare is just a you know a cover story so so i would say the the companies are raking it in they're certainly amoral or immoral about it there was a survey of them about arming the the saudi uh killings in yemen uh, and and they said, well, do you have a, do you have any principles about who you'll sell to, or do you like vet where your arm is going to end up? Uh, and they, they either didn't answer. Or they said, well, you know, it's not up to us. We just do what the government policy is. And they make it sound like they're just sort of these innocent bystanders. But of course, they spend a lot of money and a lot of lobbying shaping government policy, making it more aggressive, reducing any kind of human rights strictures. 
So they kind of create an environment where war is more likely. So in an indirect sense, they they bear responsibility. But in any given conflict, it's often the civilian leadership that kind of pushes it initially. Thank you, Bill, very much. Um, I'm not sure who was the uh, the person that wanted to ask the question uh, live. Are they still with us? And if so, yes, yes. Oh, we'll get it. We're going to give you the last question. We're going to thank you. Go that's why, that. that's, so that's why. That's very generous. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> two two quick questions. One is, <clears throat> I spoke to a gentleman who was a nuclear engineer who spent his life in this nuclear sub and gave me an update on what they are. We've got 30 of those. That is more than enough to take care of any any business that the ICBMs have. And it seems to me that ICBMs are relevant when you've got a, a couple of nuclear subs in the, in the Mediterranean. That's a question. Uh, the second comment is, have we learned absolutely nothing from the uh, existing past wars like, like Afghanistan that we are in a different era of, of warfare uh, where a small inexpensive device can knock out a multi-million dollar item like an airplane and so forth and that people are becoming increasingly irrelevant except for the use of weapons to kill civilians because of this incredibly uh, disaster program developed in World War II, that it's a good idea psychologically to kill the population so you can win the psycho war. Two questions, that's all. Uh, yeah, well, there's no question. I mean, even if you think nuclear deterrence is the way to go, uh, then no, you don't need ICBMs. There's so many nuclear weapons and submarines, and they're, they're less likely to be able to be destroyed. Um, I mean, I think getting rid of the ICBMs should be a first step towards getting rid of nuclear weapons altogether, which is the only way to truly be safe. Um, and, you know, have we learned from the wars? Um, I think if the average person had the information, they would say our current approach is insanity. Uh, but the military planners and the industry are very slow to change gears because the current system is making people a lot of money. Uh, but, um, you know, we did, a, we're doing a paper on the, the push for all these new technologies and they're making all kinds of claims about how this is going to change warfare and it's going to give us the edge and kind of reduce civilian casualties. They do this every generation or, or yes. sooner than, and, and Vietnam was the electronic battlefield was supposed to locate the North Vietnamese, cut off their supply lines. And they would do stuff like, oh, well, let's send some empty trucks over here and then they'll go there. Then we'll come through with 100,000 people. Um, and basically, they outmaneuvered it with very simple measures. Or uh, under, you know, in the Rumsfeld period, there was the revolution of military affairs, which was all about network warfare, more precise strike, better communications, outflanking the enemy. Um, but in wars like Iraq and Afghanistan, those things were not that relevant. Um, and cheap countermeasures like, in, you know, um, uh, improvised explosive devices did huge damage. Uh, they were very cheap to make and they were knocking out expensive weapons. You can say the same for, you know, the, um, uh, the U.S. has been uh, sending missiles against the, the Houthi rebels in Yemen because they've been trying to interfere with traffic that, that might end up supplying things to Israel. And every missile they send is hugely expensive compared to the weapons that the Houthis are using. So the cost balance just uh, doesn't work. Um, so you would think by now they would have noticed that this thing about, well, or you look at Star Wars, of course, that was supposed to end our vulnerability to nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and at the time, uh, Edward Teller, who was the big advocate of the H-bomb and, and, you know, get got Oppenheimer's security clearance stripped, um, had this idea of lasers in space that would take out the other side's missiles. Well, it ends up, it, it, physically, it just didn't work. The laser's power would dissipate in space. It wasn't powerful to take out the missiles. But in the meantime, he was beating the drums for this thing, and they were kind of selling it as an idea to the public. 
and they had a picture of one on the cover of Time magazine, but it was just a picture. I think some people assumed, oh, this thing exists, you know. Uh, so, so I think there's there is this kind of naive notion that technology is is going to be give us the edge, but reality always intervenes. Uh, either the technology doesn't work, or it's not appropriate to the kind of wars that are being fought. Um, and uh, of course, a, a more sensible approach leaves less money for the arms makers. Um, you know, this the biggest thing that'll keep us from going to war with China is an understanding about the status of Taiwan, is cooperating on issues that we have to cooperate on if we're going to solve them, like climate change. Um, and, you know, an arms race and saber rattling and planning how we're going to win a war, the most likely outcome of that is a war. It's it's, it's not a stable situation. So um, in that sense, a lot of it is the industry um, because they don't, you know, they don't make much money out of peace. Um and and this like diehard notion that that force equals power. And, but even if you were a diehard militarist, if you took an objective look at the wars of this century, force didn't win the day against relatively uh, you know poorly armed adversaries because it was on their turf. They had morale. Uh, our people didn't know what they're getting into. So machines still are not the uh, dominant force. I mean, the, the sad thing is they can do a huge amount of damage even in a war that uh, the U.S. in essence loses. So, yeah, I think if more people sort of thought about that, we would have a better chance of heading off these wars. But the, the elites have a little bit of a vested interest in just not taking that in. Um, but it's quite extraordinary, really, you know, given how badly those wars have gone, how many people have suffered, that they're still selling us military technical solutions, um, which are not going to work, you know. Well, we don't have to buy it. No, we don't. We shouldn't. Yeah. Well, well thank you, Bill. Thank I'll you. Tell you, everybody, I wanted you to unmute and we'll give Bill a, a round of applause here and appreciate the not just the time that he gave us tonight, but he certainly has shared with us a lot of information that he's acquired and woven together in a way that many other people could not do. So, Bill, thank you so much for what you've done tonight. And, and for what you when she to do. came down to visit me, she Look at that. The door. Yes, thank you. Uh, 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 thank you all for joining. Not everybody spends uh, their evening talking about this kind of stuff, so I appreciate it. Take care, Bill. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Thank you. By the way, I found the Ellsberg book very helpful. It's Paul Do you recall that? Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Terry. Yeah. My work was easy. Samantha and Tossin were mm -hmm. the backstops to make it all work. Thank you, Terry, mm -hmm. Tossin, and Samantha. Yeah, thank you, all of you. Thank Samantha you. was driving all of it. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, she's driving a convertible with the top down. <laughs> yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank Good you. night.